What do you think makes a good Saturday night, Ant? Mate. Having a laugh? Yes. What else? Pal. Excitement. <laughs> you, you're right, buddy. But what about some tension? <laughs> but aren't you forgetting something? Oh, yeah, I am, aren't I? Eh? Some interaction with the opposite sex. <laughs> but what about the people who are there for you? Think. Uh, mm, in need is a mm, indeed. Saturday nights would never be the same without your friends. <laughs> That's the one. Friends Like These, a new series starts Saturday at 6.50 on BBC One. Everything you'd expect from a Saturday night with your mates. That really good. And you can explore the future of Saturday night viewing with the new issue of the Radio Times, which also contains complete listings for all major television channels. The Sins starts tomorrow, 10 past 9 on BBC One. From countryside raids to global domination, today's clubbers have come a long way. Presented by top name DJs, Choice World Clubbing is the definitive guide to the best nightlife around the world. The cost of clubbing, the best bars, the best hangouts, the fashion, the culture. Choice World Clubbing, Wednesdays at 10.30 on BBC Choice and Fridays at 12.55 on BBC Two. This is BBC One. With a late look at the weather, here's David Brain. Hello again and welcome to Weatherview. Despite all the showers we saw today, there were parts of the country that had some sunshine. And right at the top of the league was Leeds. They had almost eight hours of sunshine through Monday. Things about the same for tomorrow as well. Leeds could also get some sunshine for tomorrow, but towards the evening we'll see more cloud. And it's this big lump of cloud we've been watching coming across the Atlantic over the last couple of days. It's an area of low pressure. Eventually it makes its way across us, more especially, I think, overnight, Tuesday night into Wednesday, to give a fairly wet night for a good part of the United Kingdom. And also, as you can see, lots of isobars there. It means the winds are going to freshen up as well. In general, for the next few days, we're going to have some quite blustery conditions. Strongest winds towards the end of the afternoon into the evening across the Irish Sea coast through Northern Ireland and into the southwest of Scotland. Strong enough, in fact, for us to give you a bit of an early warning about the severity of these winds. Severe gales possible in southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland, parts of Wales and the southwest of England. I think overnight, Tuesday night into Wednesday, we could have gusts up at 70 miles an hour. Of course, we'll keep you informed closer to the time. Now for tomorrow's forecast, Tuesday's forecast, should be a lot of fine dry weather around. Early morning sunshine, but gradually clouding over in the afternoon. And then that wet and windy weather really gets in towards the end of the afternoon into Northern Ireland and the southwest of Scotland. So a range of temperatures, 12 where it turns out to be wet in the afternoon, as much as 15 or 16 where we hold on to a little bit of sunshine. Now through Tuesday evening and overnight Tuesday night, that wet weather travels across a large part of the United Kingdom, but it is moving reasonably well, so hopefully much of that rain will move away into the North Sea and take with it those very strong winds as well. So some cloudy conditions in southern England and South Wales with outbreaks of rainfall much of Wednesday. The same in the north of Scotland. Between the two, some blustery showers. Those winds beginning to ease as you move through the night and into Thursday. So Thursday should be a quieter day and perhaps even with a few mispatches first thing in the morning. Well, let's move further afield. Let's have a look at Europe because here some unsettled conditions in the north of Europe. But into the Mediterranean and a large part of Central and Eastern Europe, it should be dry. Apart from that is across Turkey and towards Cyprus, where a scattering of showers are likely as we move through Tuesday afternoon. For the really dry and hot weather, then we look into parts of the Middle East and across Afghanistan, Pakistan and into India, where the dry conditions continue. And that's good news, of course, for our one-day international cricket match. Pakistan versus England in Karachi for Tuesday. The conditions here, pretty good. Hot and dry, 32 the top temperature and lots of sunshine. Now, further away into the rest of Asia, we see a scattering of showers. Lots of cloud on the satellite picture here. There's been some wet weather in southern China, turning more showery now. But some of the wettest weather has been in Japan, where we've seen 106 millimetres of rain here in Owasi in the space of a day. That's a lot of rain going a long way towards what they normally expect for the entire month of October. But thankfully, Tuesday's forecast is much drier as that wet weather moves away. Into China, well, a scattering of showers in southern parts of China. Beijing's temperature up at around 20 degrees, but not too bad. And if you need to find out more details about world weather, you can check out our website, but also look at CFAX page 400. That's all from me. Bye for now. There's no doubt he can hold a crowd as well as he can hold a pint. He's known for his natty dress sense, whether he's in town or in the country. His views certainly don't endear him to everyone, but that's enough about me. Jeremy Clarkson talks to William Haig. Clarkson, Thursday at 10 on BBC Two.
Morning. Morning. You don't need to drive everywhere. And I'm only going to get that papers. It doesn't take much to do your bit for the environment. Are you doing your bit to fight local pollution? Call 0345 86 86 86 and find out more. This is BBC One, joining BBC News 24 through the night. News at Carrefour in Paris. This is BBC News 24, tonight's main headlines. The Labour MP Michael Martin has been elected Speaker of the Commons after a bad-tempered series of votes. The General Medical Council has struck off an anaesthetist, Dr John Evans Appiah, after finding him guilty of serious professional misconduct. As the clear-up continues after the Hatfield rail crash, it's been announced that Rail Track will have nearly £15 billion to spend on improving the railways over the next five years. More on our main story now, and if you don't know already, the Labour backbencher Michael Martin has been elected the new Speaker of the House of Commons. Mr Martin, a former sheet metal worker from Glasgow, is the first Catholic Speaker since Thomas Moore prior to the Reformation. At the end of a seven-hour sitting, he was dragged to the Speaker's chair. He'd been endorsed by 370 votes to eight after seeing off 11 rivals. In his acceptance speech, the Speaker-elect said he prayed he'd be worthy of the confidence the House had in him. Order. Order. Oh, I understand that uh, I have some formal words that uh, normally I take a speak before I go into the, the throne here. <laughs> <laughs> but what I would like to say is this is, it's been a long day. And I don't want to keep you. But I think that this house owes its gratitude to Sir Edward, the father yeah. of the house. Yeah. I wonder if the house will also allow me to say that my thoughts are with my wife, Mary, my son, Paul, and my daughter, Mary, and my grandson, Ryan. Mm. Family is important to me, and I will endeavour to see that families are included in the proceedings of this house. Yeah. Yeah. Before I assume the chair as Speaker as elect, I want once again to thank the House for its confidence in me. I pray that I shall prove worthy of that confidence and that all of us will maintain the high tradition of this place. I also ask for your prayer. Thank you. Yeah. Mr Speaker-elect's first job was to call the Prime Minister to address Commons. I have pleasure in calling the Prime Minister. Prime Minister? Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker-elect, it is my pleasure to be the first member of this House to offer you our congratulations on your election. Much has been made, Mr Speaker-elect, of your origins of hardship and difficulty being brought up in Scotland in circumstances of poverty, and no doubt those will give you a special insight into the position of many people in this country. But I want to lay stress not on your origins, but on your quality, your integrity and your worldly wisdom. Yeah. You said when you spoke a moment or two ago that you had never been offered by any Labour leader a government or front bench job. I want to say on behalf of this Labour leader what a very great oversight I now realise that was. <clears throat> I, should, I should also say, because I know you will feel this, that you will feel a sense of, of joy and pride for your constituents in Glasgow Springburn. And I remember too, uh, back in the 1980s when you and I were on uh, committees together, I remember you once telling me what a tough training ground Glasgow was in politics, in particular for speeches and that when you made a good speech in Glasgow, they didn't applaud, they just let you live. And... <laughs> but you follow a long line of people who fulfilled the office recently with very great distinction, not least of all, of course, 
uh, Betty Boothroyd, who was a superb speaker, who enjoyed a fantastic reputation, not just in this house, but in the whole of the country. And I think you know, and we all know, this will be a hard act to follow. The leader of the Conservative Party, William Hague, was next to congratulate Mr Martin. But he said the system used for the election may not have been ideal. Uh, Mr Speaker-elect, I too wish to offer you my congratulations on your election and your great achievements today. No matter how many right honourable and honourable members voted for you are or against you, you are now Speaker of the whole House of Commons. And I should like, too, to echo the words of thanks of the Prime Minister to my right honourable friend, the member for Old Bexley and Sidcup, as father of the House, for the unflappable way, not to say completely immovable way, <laughs> in, which, in which he has conducted proceedings today. Uh, nevertheless, the large number of candidates on this occasion has raised a legitimate question about the procedures used for this purpose, a question I believe the House should consider during your speakership. Other news. Campaigning for the White House is now down to the final fortnight and it's still too close to call between Al Gore and George W. Bush. Healthcare reform was one promise that President Clinton failed to deliver. 44 million low-income Americans have no medical insurance, but critics say neither candidate is giving health care the priority it deserves in their campaigns. Stephen Sacco reports on the health of the nation. The center of the tumor is located at the center of the helmet. The best health care money can buy. Detroit's Harper Hospital has a $13 million gamma knife which removes brain tumors without surgery. This high-tech miracle machine saves lives and turns a profit. Here at the top end of American medicine, life is sweet. We can deliver the most expensive, the most sophisticated, the most advanced health care to anyone in the U.S. But it doesn't take a brain surgeon to see the failings of the U.S. system. A mile from Harper Hospital, two dozen people, many of them seriously sick, rely on a Catholic charity and volunteer doctors for basic health care. Gwendolyn Wallace has lupus, her immune system devastated. She had no insurance to pay for treatment or medicine. Now she's $10,000 in debt and desperate. Everybody is sending my name to collection agency to try to get the money. Try to explain to them I don't have the money. I can just pay so much, but the system, I don't know, the system is not working for me. A staggering 44 million Americans are uninsured. Short of an immediate life-threatening condition, there's no safety net. We had one gentleman who was trying to get treatment for a tumor growing in the back of his head. So we had to mobilize what we could here. And I sent a doctor in with local anesthetic and scalpels and dressings and suture, and we removed it here. This is not... This is third world medicine in the middle of the richest country in the world. The presidential candidates pay lip service to the problem, but neither George Bush nor Al Gore have any intention of ending the health care chasm between the haves and have-nots. Which makes Catherine and Ron Phillips, both with chronic illnesses, furious. They're from Michigan, but they buy their medicines here in Canada. Thanks to Canadian drug price controls, they save 700 pounds every month. There's no reason why one country can provide for their people, and our country isn't doing that. This is a presidential election of strictly limited ambition. It will not produce radical health care reform. And that's understandable, because the people left out of the system wield little power, and most of them won't even vote. Stephen Sacker, BBC News. Detroit. Well, Clarence Mitchell is here from one o'clock, but before that, let's get a weather update with Rob McKelvey. <laughs> Thought I wasn't going to make it, but we're here now. Now. I'm following, or we have been following, this storm here in the central Atlantic, which is heading towards us. Now, I call it a storm because that's what it was. But in the last 24 hours or so, it seems to have broadened out. And it's a, a big leaf of cloud now to the south and another one to the north. So it's got a brother. 
that really means complications for us. That means for a Monday evening we had two storms. By the time we get to this coming lunchtime, we've still got two, but they want to amalgamate. And that's where the problem is. That means somewhere there's going to be strong winds and virtually everywhere there's going to be a fair amount of heavy rain. So we'll need to firm up on the detail, but the chances are that the worst weather will come later this coming night, so Tuesday night, 24 hours time or so, for southwest Scotland, Northern Ireland, maybe for Wales and southwest England with strong gales, gusts up to 70 miles an hour, through the central lowland belt of Scotland, maybe up to 70 miles an hour. But that's to come. This night that we're in now, it's just breezy, and the few showers that were around are slowly going to die out. The heaviest ones have been through western Scotland and the north of England and north Wales. As you can see, the, the bright tops are, generally speaking, becoming fewer, and that may not be true for the western highlands of Scotland. So that also means the cloud will largely clear as well. That would normally, at this time of the year, give us a frost, but the wind helps that to keep away. Five degrees the lowest in Highland Scotland. Now, as the cloud is clearing and the showers are going, it should be a nice start. Good dawn. Nice bit of sunshine. If you haven't got the sunshine, you'll be unlucky. Possibly it's because you're in Northern Ireland, because I think this will be the first place for the cloud then to thicken enough to take out the sunshine. And by lunchtime, it'll be raining. That rain in the afternoon will cross into Western Scotland, Western England and Wales. At the same time, there'll be some shearing of the high cloud ahead of it, so the sunshine will turn milky after that. The temperatures, well, 14 to 16 doesn't look good. It's about what we had uh, yesterday. With the wind it won't help, but the sunshine I think will make it feel pretty nice for about half the day at least. I mean, if you're, for example, going to the races at Cheltenham, Redcar or Nottingham, should be a good day. Bit of sunshine, slowly clouding up, 14 degrees, bit of a breeze. Now, as I said, it's going to go downhill. The evening, this coming evening, looks wet and windy. Just to use two words, the strongest winds haven't yet got here by this time. No, it's into the night time when the rain springs eastwards. In 24 hours' time, this is. Then the start of Wednesday when that blast of westerly gales comes in. So the worst weather then, the coming night, Tuesday night, 24 hours' time, and Wednesday morning. Gun battles again rage in the Middle East as Israel tries to form an emergency government. A new era in the United States' relations with North Korea as Madeleine Albright continues her historic tour. And unrest in Peru as President Fujimori's disgraced intelligence chief returns after a month in exile. And Britain's House of Commons has a new speaker after a voting procedure dating back hundreds of years. Hello, this is BBC News. I'm Clarence Mitchell. Talks between the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak and the leader of the opposition Likud party Ariel Sharon have broken up without an agreement on the formation of an emergency government. The two men are due to meet again on Tuesday. There have been further clashes, meanwhile, between Palestinian gunmen and the Israeli army on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Witnesses say Israeli tanks shelled the West Bank village of Beit Jalal after shots were fired at the Jewish neighborhood of Gilo, less than a mile away. Tonight, Israeli machine guns open up on the very edge of Jerusalem. This after Palestinian gunmen fired their weapons towards the city. The Palestinians of Beit Jala are starting to pay a high price for the actions of the gunmen who use their town for cover. The Nazal family spent the day clearing up the wreckage caused when an Israeli tank round burst into the children's room last night. It all merely helps to fuel Palestinian anger. There were familiar scenes at all the usual places today. From stones to guns, this Palestinian uprising now has several faces and shows no sign of ending. Israel has shown again that it will use its big guns, but only, it says, if the Palestinians shoot first. High above Beit Jala, a wall now shields the Jewish settlement of Gilo, on the southern fringes of Jerusalem. The bullet came in from here, uh, straight to here, and it came but even with the tanks and the walls, Mada Yaakov doesn't feel safe. We found her getting ready to leave. She hoped it would only be for a few days. A single bullet ripped through her entire wardrobe, but Israel says even one bullet is intolerable. 
a few hours after sunset and Bejala was getting ready for trouble. It didn't take long. Already tonight, the shooting has started again. In the last few minutes, we've heard several bursts of automatic gunfire coming from one of the rooftops behind me. The streets of Beit Jala are completely deserted. No one knows here if they're going to have another difficult night. Israel's response triggered immediate panic. The people of Beit Jala didn't ask to live in a battleground. They know that when Israel hits back, it hits back hard. Minutes later, up at Gilo, we watched the tanks in action. The two sides are still only using the language of force. Paul Adams, BBC News, on the edge of Jerusalem. Well, our Middle East correspondent, Barbara Plett, now joins us live from Jerusalem. Barbara, the situation seems as bad as ever on the ground. Um, what of these latest clashes? Well, our latest information is that the situation on the edge of Jerusalem is still tense but calm. There were several rounds of fire exchanged, Palestinians shooting at the Israeli settlement of Gilo, Israelis responding with machine gun fire, and they also launched at least one uh, mortar shell in the direction of the fire. Um, there have been other clashes, though, in Hebron, the, uh, in the West Bank town of Hebron. One Palestinian man was killed after a prolonged gun battle between Israeli soldiers guarding a settlement there and some Palestinian gunmen. And uh, a bomb went off in the Gaza Strip uh, near the road as an Israeli convoy went by, although nobody was hurt. How significant is the fact that uh, Mr. Barak has failed to cobble together a coalition with Likud so far? Well, it indicates that it's a very difficult uh, job because uh, Mr. Ariel Sharon, the head of the Likud party, is asking for quite a lot of influence in, the, in this coalition government should it be formed. However, um, it wasn't expected to happen in one day. Uh, talks are going to continue tomorrow. The idea was to try to cobble together some kind of national unity government by the end of the week so that uh, there could be a strong force presented when Parliament resumes sessions at the end of the month. The Palestinians, though, of course, maintain that um, Mr. Barak's decision to put on hold the peace process was in itself a major concession to Mr. Sharon. Uh, was that the case, do we think? And um, obviously it hasn't been enough if it was. Well, there was some, uh, some speculation, especially in the Israeli press, that this was in fact the case, that, uh, that Mr. Barak was trying to woo Mr. Sharon by putting us... Uh, uh, putting a halt to the peace process for a while. It wasn't enough. Uh, Mr. Sharon has uh, actually come out and said that directly. He said it's not enough just to suspend the peace process for, for a while. I want guarantees that if negotiations should start again sometime down the road, they won't do so on the basis of terms agreed already between the Israelis and the Palestinians because Likud believes that what uh, Mr. Barak has agreed or offered to the Palestinians, I should say, um, are dangerous concessions. That's what they call it. Uh, so no, if the timeout was a concession to Mr. Sharon, it wasn't enough. In the absence of, of course, substantive political movement, the vacuum is filled by violence on the one hand, but uh, there are fears as well that both sides could now move unilaterally. Yes, that is the fear because they're not talking anymore. Um, there is some belief, the Israelis believe anyway, that the Palestinians are going to declare unilaterally a Palestinian state by the 15th of November. And they're toying with the idea of unilateral moves of their own, um, which would be a separation of the Palestinians from Israel by uh, unilaterally deciding what the borders were, setting up blockades there, and essentially cutting or certainly restricting economic links. Now, this is still in a ver very vaguely spoken about and there are lots of questions about how to implement that, um, such as, you know, where would you, where would you put the borders? What would you do with Israeli settlements? Um, how can you deal with, how can you just cut off economic ties when the two, two groups are so economically intertwined? Uh, but there is, there is discussion about that prospect at the moment, and, and it would probably lead to more confrontation rather than less. Barbara Plett in Jerusalem, thanks very much. There have been historic talks in the North Korean capital, Pyongyang, between the American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, and the hardline communist leader, Kim Jong-il. The meeting could signal the end of one of the last great Cold War standoffs. Korea was divided into a communist north and capitalist south at the end of the war in 1953. The north is one of the last communist dictatorships, run first by Kim Il-sung until his death in 1994, when his son, Kim Jong-il, took over. In recent years, a devastating famine is estimated to have killed thousands of children, and there's been concern over North Korea's missile program and its nuclear ambitions. 
after a day of diplomacy, an evening of celebration. But this event, attended by tens of thousands of North Koreans, was more propaganda blitz than welcoming ceremony. Officially, it marked the 55th anniversary of the North Korean Communist Party. It was added to Mrs. Albright's itinerary just hours earlier by Kim Jong-il himself. The North Korean leader had never met an American official before. Both sides hope this historic handshake will mark the beginning of a new era. If this visit goes well, he could soon play host to President Clinton. But there are vast differences to overcome, and a little awkwardness was perhaps inevitable. This is Washington's main concern. North Korea not only develops missiles, it also sells the technology to countries such as Iran, Syria and Pakistan. The US believes North Korea may now be ready to discuss ending its missile program and cutting its links to terrorist groups. If it does, that would clear the way for Washington to lift its remaining sanctions on North Korea and normalize relations. That can't come quickly enough for these children. They lie festering in makeshift hospital beds just an hour's drive from Pyongyang. More than 60% of North Koreans are chronically malnourished, living in grinding medieval poverty. They are sick and hungry and hopeless. This drip is homemade. It's filled with sugar water. These were the children on show to Mrs. Albright. But even here, they rely on UN food aid. They sang songs praising Kim Jong-il. This may be the only time Mrs. Albright dances to North Korea's tune, but her personal style delighted those here. It will take more than goodwill and ceremony, though, to build a new relationship, as Mrs. Albright acknowledged at a banquet in her honor. The United States understands that differences developed over many decades are real and cannot be eliminated overnight. We must be pragmatic and recognize that the road to fully normal relations remains uphill. Mr. Kim's deputy, Jo Myung-rok, said North Korea was actively working towards detente and reconciliation. It was a poignant end to a day in which, for once, the U.S. and North Korea looked to the future instead of the past. Richard Lister, BBC News, Pyongyang, North Korea. Protesters have taken to the streets of the Peruvian capital, Lima, calling for the arrest of the disgraced former intelligence chief, Vladimiro Montesinos, who's returned unexpectedly from exile. There have been reports of skirmishes, and the security forces have used tear gas to disperse the demonstrators. Opposition leaders say Mr. Montesinos's presence in Peru is tremendously destabilizing. Once again, life in Peru centers on the fate of Vladimir Montesinos. He left the country to seek asylum in Panama just four weeks ago. Now he's back. His plane arrived at this military base south of the capital, Lima, in the early hours of Monday morning. So far, no clear reason has been given for Mr. Montesinos' surprise return. For the moment, it's not clear whether he has decided to return temporarily.